When we think about what's been going on in human evolution over the past several years, there are lots and lots of exciting sites that we didn't know existed five years ago. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's really been changing. And yet, there are some sites in our field that have been continually producing new discoveries and will continue to produce them in the future. Out of all of those sites, maybe one of the most important is Sturkfontein. Sturkfontein is in the Cradle of Humankind World Heritage Site, which is just outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. The first hominin fossil discoveries at Sturkfontein were made by Robert Broom, who was a paleontologist working with the University of Witwatersrand, and he went to this site looking for evidence of early hominids. He was trying to do what Raymond Dart had already done at a couple of other sites in South Africa. Broom found some spectacular evidence of early hominin evolution at Sturkfontein. The evidence like this skull, STS-5. This skull became nicknamed Mrs. Plez because Broom named it Plesianthropus transvalensis. And looking at the anatomy of the skull today, you can see why he was not able to say with great certainty whether this was the same species as Australopithecus africanus, the specimen, the Chong specimen that had been discovered by Raymond Dart uh, in the early 1920s. It's an adult, and Tong is a kid. They're not directly comparable in most ways. It wasn't until later, as we began to appreciate the variability of discoveries from this time frame in South Africa, that we began to lump these things together into the species Australopithecus africanus. Nowadays, we talk about almost every hominin discovery between about three million years ago and something a little more than two million years ago in South Africa. We talk about all of them as members of Australopithecus africanus. And we see a clear distinction between africanus and the robust Australopithecines. In South Africa, Australopithecus robustus, which is chiefly later in time. Sturkfontein, the site, is a very complex site. It accumulated its deposits in distinct events that make up different parts of what formerly was a very large cave. Nowadays, there is still a large underground cave at Sturkfontein. It's really a display cave where you can walk through and see the cave formations. You know, it's classic, go on a tour of an underground cave. But there's also a large area of breccia, which was formerly the floor of a cave, that over many, many hundreds of thousands of years was accumulating sediments, bones of early hominins and baboons and all other kinds of vertebrates falling into it, being cemented together as a breccia. And that breccia at Sturkfontein is enormous. It covers a very large area. I went on a tour of the site with the director today, Dominic Stratford, and he showed me what's going on with the different parts of the site. The breccia that has been so productive in the past produced fossils like STS-5 and STS-14, which consists of a partial skeleton, uh, this innominate bone, this bone of the pelvis, being one of the most famous parts because this was the first hominin pelvis discovery from Africa to really show a bipedal pelvis in these early hominins. Tremendous discoveries of jaws and teeth. This may be the most famous, STW 50, STS-52. Uh, this showing the dentition of Australopithecus africanus. It's a dentition which is very much like, in many respects, the East African dentitions from Australopithecus afarensis earlier in time, but which, as we know from this and many other specimens from Sturkfontein, varied substantially. Some of the teeth from Sturkfontein as large as the molars of the robust Australopithecine, Australopithecus robustus, and some much smaller, much more like other early hominids. We see at the site tremendous evidence of variation in the cranium. So as an example, this famous skull, STS-5, and this skull, STW-505, they differ in their endocranial volumes by more than 
It's a huge difference between these two skulls. And that difference is manifested by the cranial size. You can see that we've got a really big face in STW505, a relatively much smaller face in STS5. Part of this variation may be attributable to male versus female variation, but part of it just reflects the fact that this is a really variable sample. And in fact, we have substantially smaller crania than STS5, smaller crania that are you know, probably almost certainly females compared to this large cranium. STS5 is almost in the middle. And if you look very carefully at the breccia that surrounded it, you'll see that that breccia preserves the evidence of the temporal lines. So we can really look at its morphology compared to the others. Sterkfontein was also the first place where we had evidence from Australopithecus of the valgus angle of the knee. Everything about the skeleton of Australopithecines from top to bottom was initially noted among the Sterkfontein sample. That clear pattern of bipedal locomotion we now often talk about at earlier sites, like Hadar, representing Australopithecus afarensis. But in the history of paleoanthropology, it was Sterkfontein that established this pattern. What's so cool about Sterkfontein is that there are parts of the site that are still being discovered. So now, less than 20 years ago, a cavern beneath the main part of the site yielded evidence first of an ankle, the you know, the ankle bone of, of an early hominin. We didn't know for sure at that point what species it was. It looked like it could have been substantially older than Australopithecus africanus, the main part of the sample, and its age is still in some question. So it might be earlier than the other specimens from the site. After that ankle was found, Ron Clark and his team, looking through the nearby sediments, found the place where the distal tibia, that distal part of the shin bone, was still embedded in the rock. That ankle was attached to a skeleton, and the skeleton began to emerge. That skeleton, which got the nickname Littlefoot, is still being brought out of the rock, taking that slowly out of the rocky matrix that it's embedded in. has taken now almost 20 years, and it's still underway. Even deeper in the site is a cavern called the Djakovic Cavern. And the Djakovic Cavern might be substantially earlier than any other parts of the site. Dominic took me down into the Djakovic Cavern, and we looked at the excavations that haven't yet begun, with bones there in the stony matrix waiting to be excavated. And he talked to me about what's going on at the site. He gave us a good tour of what is actually there in the Djakovic Cavern waiting to be uncovered. And he talked about his own experience in the field. I started off my undergraduate in Egyptology, uh -huh. mostly a language-based course, and then uh, through my own interests I started to move towards the technology and the earliest technology we found mm -hmm. in Egypt and was available to me in the museums, and then I sort of came to South Africa, because my family are from South Africa, I drew, grew up in, in Johannesburg, and then I got in contact with Kathy Kuman, who was going to be my future supervisor, and she said, we have lots of projects at Stokefontein. We have a, a wonderful example of an older one, Assemblage. Uh -huh. uh, and we'd love for you to come and have a look. That's and great. So I came here and I didn't have any idea about caves or, yeah. or site formation in caves or an older one, Assemblage. Uh -huh. And so I started looking at it and it, it was very clear that in order to understand the Assemblages, whether they're, they're bones or stones underground, we have to understand how they got there. Yeah. And so my master's was on purely sort of old one technology and then I sort of gradually started to move towards stratigraphy and cave site formation processes in order that we can better understand and put together those assemblages all the way through their depositional history to the point at which they were made on the surface, whether the animals were dying, whether they were snapping stone tools. We want to find out about behavior but we have to understand how these deposits were formed sure. in order that we can put that story back together again. Yeah. So that's what my PhD was on, and then now I'm here. Now I get to explore caves and find fossils. And that's incredible, work yeah. Every day underground, which is wonderful. If a student wanted to get into this area, what would you tell them? I would say 
Uh, absolutely, I would say it's exciting. I'd say you, you, it's very. Every day is different. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that it's a. I absolutely love it. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Um, you have to be fairly flexible, but I think it's it's a, a wonderful career. You do get to travel uh, quite a lot. There are lots of benefits to being in this this career, and um, I would highly recommend it. I would recommend getting in contact with your local paleoanthropologist or or anthropology professor uh -huh. and talking to him. And and I would hope that there were lots of opportunities. You have this incredible broad background because of how you came into it. Do you think that was helpful to you? I think it was in certain aspects. I think I was a bit of a, a, a late starter in terms of my paleoanthropological training. Uh -huh. um, and it took me a little while to catch up. Uh, so my, my experience and skills at faunal recognition and morphological analysis aren't particularly hot. However, <laughs> um, I am still learning and you still learn through your entire career in this, in, in this field. Beautiful. Um, but yes, I do think that it benefited me in that I have a uh, sort of experience of different contexts, whether or not it's digging Viking sites in England, mm -hmm. whether or not it's digging Ignatian sites in France, or digging here in late Pliocene material in, at Stokefontein. It does provide you with that, that, that experience that you can apply to all of these different contexts. That's great. Thanks. It's a pleasure.